Good morning, everyone. We're happy to see you whether you're in person or online. If this is your first time, you can go ahead and scan this QR code. And if you fill out that connect card, we'll send you some free Opus coffee. And make sure to check out the coffee with Joe option because then you can enjoy that cup of Joe with Joe Smith himself. Then you can ask any and all questions you're wanting to know. Summer is coming up quick and there are going to be several important announcements. But the most important one right now is our next all shift meeting on June 2nd. So mark your calendars now. It's gonna be no more than 30 minutes right after service and childcare is available for those who need it. Also, we are almost halfway to our Thanksgiving meal giveaway. Already, I know, time goes fast. Don't ask me. Bring in your generosity jars, dump all that extra change into the big jar, and if you don't have one, then just grab one. Duh. Any and all change is gonna go to feeding families during the holidays. Our first magnitude group is meeting this Friday at 6 p.m. So come on, chill out, have fun, and... Yeah, that's, that's, that's literally all that the group does. Yep, they just hang out and have fun. All right, that's all I gotta say about that one. And now on to week four of our series, Don't Throw the Day Away, with guest speaker, Caitlin Castro. So, um, when Joe first asked me to speak, I hurried up and said yes as fast as humanly possible, because otherwise I would freak myself out and say no. So, out of my comfort zone a little bit, but my husband and I went and saw one of my absolute favorite authors last weekend in Miami, Anne Lamott, and at the very end of her speech, she gave us some writing props, one of which was, there was a tree, which felt pretty fitting because I'm also going to talk about a tree a little bit today, so I took it as a little bit of a nod, and here we are. So, like I said, when Joe asked me to speak, I panicked and wrote like 17 pages of notes after rereading like four books and a bunch of podcasts and then I was even more overwhelmed because of course I had like 17 pages of notes and like what am I going to do with 17 pages of notes so I decided I would go to like a peaceful place I live with a lot of people so I didn't want to be in my <laughs> in my house so I went to one of the most peaceful places nearby my house which is Dade Battlefield State Park um, which doesn't sound that great, but there is a big, beautiful 250 plus year old oak tree that stands there and we have a picture of it. The picture doesn't do it justice. It's beautiful, it's peaceful, there's just a bunch of grass around. So I took my iPad and a blanket out there and I was like, I'm just gonna sit and listen. And so I did and kind of what I heard was if this tree could talk, it would have a lot of stories. Um, if you don't know the history of Dave Battlefield State Park, I'll let you look it up on your own time, but let's just say it's beautiful, but it's got like a dark history. So this kind of just reminded me that everything's kind of connected. All our good stories, all our bad stories, all of that. Um, the Druids and ancient Celtic Christians, my maiden name is O'Brien, so I'll probably talk about the Celts quite a bit. They've got a special place in the park. Um, but they believe that the oak tree was especially sacred. The word druid actually means bearer of oak wisdom, which was a way of knowing that like these ancient trees, the roots dig way deep in the ground and the branches way up into the heavens, kind of connecting heaven and earth. So as I was sitting there, I re-listened to the song that we're supposed to be talking about, and there were a couple lines that kind of struck me, um, one of which is there's bad times, but that's okay, just look for the love in it, the other of which is this love will open our world. From the dark side, we can see the glow of something bright. There's much more than we see here. Connected, these things kind of remind me that we got to take our good stories and our bad stories and hold those. And remember that if we let the love in them and share our authentic selves, our authentic redemptive narratives with others, we get to be a part of moving the story forward. The Bible is full of these redemptive narratives, these form of stories, poems, so on and so forth. Um, like Moses the murderer becoming Moses the liberator, Jacob wrestling with God and walking away with a limp, Ruth not taking the conventional route and returning to her homeland, but staying with her mother-in-law. For thousands of years, we have interacted with these stories and we find ourselves in them. We hear these particulars and we can see our particulars. 
And we need those to get to the universal. Because like Father Richard Rohr says, we only learn spiritual things by metaphor and by stories. And we kind of tend to believe the stories that we're told. I don't know about you, but a lot of us were told the original story of original sin, um, that we're inherently bad, our hearts can't be trusted, our intuitions can't be trusted. But before the church got completely in bed with empire, there was another story being told. There was a British theologian named Pelagius who pretty much adamantly disagreed with Augustine. Um, but we all know who won because Augustine's theory was a lot more beneficial to empire. Um, it's a lot easier to take advantage of people when they're worthless than thinking of them as divine. But Pelagius spoke of the dignity of our human nature and said, you ought to measure the good of human nature by reference to its creator. If it is he who has made the world good, exceedingly good, how much more excellent do you suppose that he has made humanity, fashioned in his own image and likeness? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? So, if God's within all of us and we are made in the image of a divine creator, a good God, how could we inherently be bad? I think Jesus came to remind us that at our deepest, who we are intimately at the heart of our being is love. Jesus was divine, but he was also 100% human. And I think he really just came to show us that. Um, we've kind of turned him into the exception instead of being the disclosure of that. Um, we've made Jesus into this unattainable being instead of looking at him as the disclosure of what full humanity should strive to look like. Jesus primarily spoke in parables, which are stories. Uh, the word parable means to place beside. So we take something that we're familiar with, put it next to something that people aren't familiar with, and you say it's like this. So Jesus did this primarily to teach us what the divine is like, what God is like, and what the kingdom of God is like, which is whole, complete, and radically inclusive love. Um, the parable of the mustard seed is pretty short, but I think it's also really important. Uh, Matthew 13, 31 and 32, he says this. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and also becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So if we can plant a tiny seed in the life of another in our communities, it grows. And it doesn't just affect the tree itself, but all of the birds around it. I'm gonna show you a picture. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces of art from one of my favorite artists, iconist Kelly Lattimore. And I thought about summarizing what he said, but it's just really good. So I'm gonna read it to you. Jesus's parables are one of the ways Jesus trains his disciples. The parables, like the Sermon on the Mount, have always been crucial for the church to imagine the kind of community it is called to be. We discover again and again that Jesus' parables' significance points to everyday life. The parables are meant to be lived. The original audience may have been perplexed by this story. They would have known that no one would intentionally plant a mustard shrub. In fact, the Jewish Mishnah forbade the growing of mustard seeds in the garden because they were useless, annoying weeds. In the Hebrew scriptures, the birds of the air can be a reference to Gentiles, non-Jews, the foreigner. The parable suggests that the kingdom of heaven is available to everyone, even those who may be considered outsiders or not worthy. Jesus is calling us to see the significance and the insignificant. The parables of the kingdom of heaven make clear that the kingdom of heaven is not up there. Through the parables, Jesus is teaching us to be for the world the material reality of the kingdom of heaven brought down to earth. As Jesus himself is the parable of the Father, so the church is meant to be the parable of Christ a people in space and time welcoming the outcast, the foreigner, and the stranger. These kinds of communities will look like unwanted weeds to the world, or even to other Christians. However, this may be exactly the church Jesus is asking us to embody. So, if my story plants a seed in the life of another's, what ripple effects does that have for the other, and also for humanity as a whole? And how can I use my seed of a story to bring the kingdom closer to here. We all know this story affects us a lot more than a bunch of cliche platitudes on Instagram. Um, 
we can read a bunch of those all day long and not really change. But if you hear somebody's story or you read a book or watch a TV show or a movie about struggle and redemption, it moves you. If you find love in someone else's story, it does something to your heart. Somebody takes us into their particulars, into their story. We see what happened to them and how they struggled and how they responded. And we get to the universal, the big things. Love, hope, peace, inspiration, and resilience. Embodied hope, or, or, sorry, embodied history is what does something to your heart. So how do we use our stories and bring the kingdom here? If I tell you some of my story, um, I raised myself evangelical. My parents did not go to church. Um, I was a little kid begging my parents to go to church. They didn't want to, so I went alone if I, if I went. But they didn't expose me to that. I couldn't tell you exactly where I was exposed to. I don't know if it was a church tract or if it was a marquee sign outside of church. But I grew up just outside of Oklahoma City, which is like the buckle of the Bible Belt. So it was kind of unavoidable. Um, and probably by kindergarten, first grade, I went to bed fearing Satan, fearing hell, um, worrying about getting in a car accident with my parents and them dying and us dying, all of us dying and them going to hell and me being swept away to heaven as being separated for eternity. And you know, then I read all those Left Behind books. And then I was worried about the rapture and us getting swept away separately and my parents being left behind for the apocalypse. So it was scary. Do you see any of yourself in that story? Or if I continue, and I tell you that by 19, I was so heavily influenced by purity culture that I got married so that I was no longer living in sin, because the easiest way to not worry about premarital sex, sending you to eternal conscious torment, is to just get married. Then you don't have to worry about it. So I did, even though, as the church would put it, we were unequally yoked. He was not a church-going Christian, uh, so I was out of the church for many, many years. Uh, needless to say, it was not the healthiest of marriages. But I stayed for many, many years longer than I should have, because at least partially, I would have felt like a failure for divorce, because the church taught us divorce is failure. Especially for a woman, that's like ultimate failure. And that God hates divorce. So, would God hate me, even though I had tried and resisted this divorce, if I got divorced? Do you see yourself or someone you know? Or if I continue and say, after that divorce, I felt super low and broken because failure, right? Um, saw validation anywhere and everywhere while being myself with shame for that. Ended up pregnant and single. This child who is not paying attention, but they're here. <laughs> <laughs> But it caused me to grow up, chose to have a kid, here I was, being a mom, single mom. Um, but it also forced me to go back to church, also seeking validation, wholeness. And, you know, I didn't want the baby to grow up and go to hell if they didn't know Jesus. So, <laughs> you can see her face right now. Um, but anyway, seeking, seeking wholeness in that church. But I showed up there and found people not really living the way they had taught us to back in Sunday school. Um, flash forward, COVID lockdowns gave me space, space to heal, space to breathe, and finally space to question. Um, I have to admit, I had avoided a lot of biblical study past about middle school, high school, because that's when you start to realize like this doesn't quite align with what I was taught. Um, I was I was always taught to be inclusive and you know, judge people, and you know by my parents and by the church. So. You know, I went to churches who didn't really speak on those things. They didn't they didn't go into the clobber verses or the things that we had like easily as, you know, modern day people from the biggest military superpower country that the world has ever seen. It's pretty easy for us to like, you know, misinterpret some verses written by ancient people, ancient oppressed people. But I, I stayed away from that. I said I went to the surface level churches um, because I had no idea that there was any other way to interpret scripture. I didn't know that anything other than inerrancy existed. Um, but fortunately, COVID, quiet, I found the work of people like Rob Bell, Richard Moore, Rachel Held Evans, Sarah Bessie, Diana Butler Bass, Marcus Ford, Nens, Mari Sullivan. I could keep going, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. I have a list. If you want it later, hit me up. Um, but I learned that we had, in fact, been misinterpreting so much of this 
ever since the church locked down their relationship with empire. So I dove headfirst into reading and listening to everything and anything that I could and relearning everything that I thought I knew about my faith. And it opened my eyes. And once you see, you can't unsee. Do you see any of yourself in that story? We live in an era where a lot of people have no skill in seeing themselves and others. So they just remain others. Uh, the real invitation is for us to find ourselves in them, the other. When we're interacting with the other, the great invitation is not to keep them as a them, but to ask enough questions and to stay curious enough. Because if you go far enough into them, you will probably find yourself. And if you find yourself in them, you're going to find ways to love them and probably to love yourself a little bit more. You move from you over there and me over here to us. Because deep down, our fears are the same. Our joys are the same. Our heartaches are the same. And it's a lot easier not to hate somebody when you know them. And hate is much harder face to face. When we are divorced from the particulars of other people's stories, it turns the other into one thing. Who they voted for, what they posted on the internet, how they dress, or sometimes even the worst choices that they've ever made. It's hard to love somebody when you can't see their humanity. So what if we took that one person who irritates us the most, provokes us the most, or is most incomprehensible to us, and decided to try to find a little bit of ourselves in them? Ask questions until we find ourselves and tell ourselves, I'm not going to give up until I find a little bit of myself in them. What a game changer this could be. In his book, Way of Love, Professor Norman Wurzba says this, Without love, life becomes a more or less tolerable descent into death. To give up on love is also to give up on the world and each other. Additionally, love needs God to expose and explode the often anxious, often self-serving desires that are love's pretenders. The God revealed in Jesus of Nazareth introduces us to forms of love that turn customary ways of ordering life upside down and inside out, showing us that what people think about love is often far too narrow and far too small. Jesus told us to love our neighbor and also our enemy. And he told us in Matthew 25, 35 through 40, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Every experience is an experience of the divine. All of life has depth and holiness and sacred nature. The other, the least of these, are still God's temples. And we can learn a lot more from the other, the people that we consider the least of these, and even more from those whose society thinks are the least of these, by finding the divine in each one of them. Finding, figuring out how to love them. Because that other, the enemy, has a lot more to teach us than our echo chambers. We're not going to grow if we just listen to all of the people who think and act exactly like we do. If you meet somebody experiencing homelessness, and you hear their story that you know, they broke their back at work and it took them four or five years to get on social security because they didn't have their birth certificate. So they couldn't get their driver's license and they had no ID and they had no living family. So when they got evicted, they ended up on the street. It's a lot easier to understand this reality. Uh, I write a man who has been on Oklahoma's death row for longer than I have been alive, um, 35. We have been friends now for about two and a half years. And getting to know this person who society would consider the least of these and the absolute lowest of the low um, has changed me in profound ways, probably more than I can even articulate now. Um, but I think that's why, or at least one of the reasons why, Jesus wants us to love the other as much as he does. Uh, his name is Daiji, and he has been convicted of unspeakable crimes, yet has shown me more love and compassion than most Christians. She, those people with. Uh, I think we knew each other for probably over a year before he ever told me he was innocent because everyone on death row says they're innocent. But whether he is or not, um, he's been a light in my life and that of my family. 
Um, he has been a person who teaches me that everyone deserves for us to see the divine in them. And even the people that we disagree with most have value. Uh, he's been a Zen Buddhist for many, many years now. Um, and his master gave him the name Daijiri, and it means great compassion. And that's something that he teaches me. Uh, he gives me advice when I need it, need it, lets me whine about my privileged life when I need it, and cheers us on for every success and mourns our losses with us. Uh, he makes some of the most impressive cross stitch that you'll ever see. It looks like almost identical on the front and the back, which is something that I can't do. It looks like spaghetti on the back. Mm. Um, but he's fantastic. He makes us birthday cards. Um, my husband adopted my child back in December. I don't know if you've ever dealt with this, but it's really expensive. Um, and another thing, people on death row don't have a lot of income. Some of them have no income. Um, but this, this man sent us a check through the Oklahoma State Penitentiary for $11.56, which was his only money that month, but he made two. Um, would not take no for an answer because he wanted to be a part of our process and he wanted to contribute. Uh, when, I, when Joe asked me to speak, it was one of the first emails I sent. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to speak at this thing. Like, I, I'm going to send you these lyrics and tell me what you think, like whatever pops in your head. So I'm just going to read you a snippet of what he said. Love with all your being, and do not hate with all your being. Love isn't that hard a thing. We knew how to love before we knew how to hate, and we really don't know why we hate either. And to learn to love completely, without question or reservation. It's easy. Yeah, no, it really is. You've just to do it. Today was canteen day, and I had enough to buy a bag of coffee. A guy here didn't get that. Without thinking anything, but that man needs some coffee, I gave him half of mine. It's not a hard thing to do, and it don't make me no hell of a fella either. Just makes me a member of the family of man. If we meet the other, we meet the divine in them as well. Because like Jesus said, how we treat the other is how we treat him. So if I can experience deep, sincere love from death row, one of the darkest places on earth, where else can it be found? Uh, he also told me a story recently that I'll try to summarize as best as possible, but he was in the yard talking to a brand new spanking born again Christian. And he said, you know how there's nothing more bigoted than the newly converted, right? <laughs> Some other guy dips in our conversation and I say my usual expletive when someone needlessly dips into my conversation. And the new guy says with all the sincerity that he can muster, you know he's listening. While you're digesting, being your digesting, I look him squarely in the eyes and I say, why would you speak of God as if he wasn't here? You could see it dawning on him, first amusement, then crystal clear clarity, and then utter defeat. Because God isn't just in the temple. It's all a temple. The whole universe, not just earth. God doesn't dwell in one place. God dwells everywhere. Even in a prison yard, in nature, in us, each other, and even in the least of these. Uh, another creed that the Celtic Christians disagree with was something we were taught creation from nothing, um, but they believe the opposite. They believe that the universe was made from the very substance of God. So matter matters because it is the very substance of the divine. But that's another thing that was like less convenient to empire. If matter is of nothing, instead of being divine, it's a lot easier to abuse matter. Um, there's a couple quotes that I found super helpful on this. Uh, one is from Barbara Brown Taylor. Earth is so thick with divine possibility that it is a wonder we can walk anywhere without cracking our shins on altars. And in his book, Christ of the Celts, John Philip Newell says this, we need to find ways of being reminded that our religious sanctuaries are at best side chapels onto the great cathedral of creation. Otherwise, the impression is given as historically it has been again and again, that God is somehow more present within the four walls than in any other place, and that the time for meeting within the four walls of our religious sanctuaries is somehow more sacred than all other moments, and that people who gather within the four walls are somehow more holy than all other people. Jesus came to tell us that the whole thing is a temple, to open our eyes to the divine presence in all of life. We're given rituals like communion, the Eucharist, to show us the Bread and wine are holy because all bread and wine are holy. We have these rituals in order to remind us to open our eyes to the divine presence in all of life. Thomas Merton 
uh, Martin, sorry, uh, monk, mystic, author, social activist, uh, he tells often of an experience he had while walking around Louisville, Kentucky. And he is walking down the street, comes to a street corner, and realizes that everyone around him is shining like the sun and shimmering. And that although he doesn't know any of them, he loves them, and that their essence is of God. He says, if we saw this way all the time, there would be no more war, hatred, cruelty, or greed. And the only problem with seeing this way is that we would constantly want to fall down and worship one another. However, the risk of adoring one another is much less than the risk of exploiting or hating one another. The line from the song says, this love will open our world. From the dark side, we can see the glow of something bright. There's much more than we see here. Sitting under that tree that we saw, um, in this place that has this dark history, colonialism, death, war, empire, there's so much beauty there. And it reminds me that we have to hold the good with the bad and look at all things with non-duality. Hold the sacredness in both the good, the bad, and the divine and all. Because creation is good. And we can find the divine in any situation and in any human, even if we may have to look a little harder, because it's all holy. The tree, its roots stretch just as far as its branches. So much darkness happened there, but there's so much light. There are homes nearby full of families. There are birds chirping, squirrels chirping. I had to move a bunch of ants and caterpillars and all kinds of bugs off my mat when I was sitting there. And there's ferns growing all over it and moss all over it and moss all over the ground. There's Spanish moss that's playing this beautiful dance. God's alive there. God is alive here because God is the ground we're all living in. That tree reminds me that we all have roots growing and flowing, much larger than meets the eye. The roots I have intertwine with those I love and theirs of mine. Our roots create the collective, and what we grow affects the whole. It's all holy and it's all connected. The Celts also have a phrase they use, Anamkara. It means soul friend. These are the people in our lives who help change us, who our souls walk with and grow with, and my Anamkara affect the growth of my roots, the fruit of my spirit, my tree, and I affect theirs. And the seeds we plant around our roots affect the whole community and the whole kingdom. We can be that for one another. Through our stories and through the stories of each other, if we just let the love in the ball. Be authentic. You are good and loved by the divine because of exactly who you are and because of the story you have to share. So as we move into our time of reflection, um, uh, we'll have the lights turned down um, just to kind of create some of that intimacy. The band will come back up and begin to play so that it's not an awkward silence. Um, and I will um, guide you in some questions that I wrote down while I was listening uh, to what Caitlin talked about this morning. And um, when we're done, I will pray. And then there will be a quiet moment of just like, just reflect. And then for any that are here that would like to participate in communion, uh, that is what those little cups there are for. Um, representing that that reminder of matter matters, that, um, that you can find the divine in anything. And so with that idea of what she just talked about, my first question for you is this, how do the stories told to you affect how you live today. Next question I have is, what story is your life telling? And can, can you see why our stories are parables? How do we allow the spirit to heal and use our stories? My final question for you today is, how can we practice seeing the divine in and around us?
pray. Creator, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this gathering in person and online. We thank you for um, you speaking through Caitlin and her stories and um, the tree. And Lord, that resonated with me, the, the roots digging into the ground and the limbs stretching into the sky and connecting heaven and earth. And I pray that we live our lives in such a way that we connect heaven and earth, that we are that, that tree, that we are that mustard seed. God, I pray that you would begin to reveal to us the ways in which our lives are those divine parables. And Lord, I pray that we would see the, those that divinity in others as well. I, I pray that we have those, uh, those realizations, our eyes open, whatever, however we want to phrase it, where we see people that way. So God, help us to practice that today as we leave this place. Help us to begin seeing you in everyone, including ourselves. Thank you for Caitlin. Thank you for her um, willingness to be open and to not only share, but to live this way. Not just standing up here and saying things, but actually living it out. But thank you for your son. Pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear. Bring freedom to the oppressed, healing to the broken, freedom to the chains. In your name we pray. Amen.